This is National Disability Awareness Month. And this was a, an arena that I didn't know much about when I was growing up. I mean, I would see people in wheelchairs, and of course you learn to greet them and talk and, and you know, engage in the way you would with anybody else. But it seems like people have some kind of apprehension of, of dealing and, and, and encountering people with different disabilities. And we're not taught that everybody has some ability. And when I was consulting after I left broadcasting for a brief period of time, I was consulting in uh, marketing and communications, and one of my clients was the Crippled Children's Society. And they later changed that organization's name to Ability First. And when we think about it, everybody has a gift and talent to contribute to the world. And um, we are all different, we're diverse, we come in many uh, shapes, sizes, colors, uh, all, all manner of uh, personality uh, and personal expression, but we're really all children of the same creator. And we're coming more and more to understand the sense of oneness that exists, that uh, we are one with an infinite creator, whatever we call her. Uh, God has many names, uh, divine providence, uh, Charlie, it doesn't matter, but it's all one creation and we are all brothers and sisters under the skin. And it's, uh, it's a delight to be able to have this kind of awareness now where we're teaching young children, you know, that there are differences. There are children who can't hear and you, maybe you have to do sign language. Uh, people, you know, who are uh, wheelchair bound, people who have uh, physical or emotional or mental uh, challenges that they're dealing with. And I would say that blindness probably is one of the most spooky thoughts uh, that people think about, you know, they're terrified of blindness for some reason. And people have said to me, oh my gosh, no, I'd rather be deaf than blind. I go, no, 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 you don't understand. The gift of blindness is that I see black. I don't see anything, shape, shadow, nothing. I see black. And in that, I respond to people now uh, differently uh, because I hear tone of voice, I hear touch, I have the sense of, you know, the handshake or the hug, and the tone of voice for me is very important and, and in, in, in providing me a sense of comfort and trust. And it's very, uh, it's just very interesting. And, and people think about how difficult it must be to be blind, and certainly it's a challenge, believe me, it's no, it's no picnic, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And the thing that I've discovered in this experience is that it has forced me, instead of being so drawn by the visual world, which is everything in our society, we over teach to the visual rather than taking it in a, into consideration for children who have different learning modalities and abilities, uh, audio learning, uh, kinesthetic learning. And so it's just not all visual. And we're learning now, we have to balance out those different forms of of, uh, of teaching and of, of, of learning abilities that people have. And I think one of the reasons we have such large dropout numbers is because we tend to teach in one way and that's to the visual learner. And many people have other ways and forms of, of learning. So it's, it, we're broadening all this out and it's very exciting to be able to bridge this, these, these kind of uh, gulfs that exist between uh, people that are considered able and people that are considered disabled. And I like the idea of abilities first because we all have an, a gift or an ability. And I believe that we all are here to find out what our abilities are, to discover our gifts, to develop them, and to give them back to the world in order to make the world a better place for everyone. And I see these movements going on and it's very exciting and very beautiful to, to experience them. So I'm thrilled to be a part of the celebration of Disability Awareness Month. The title of my book is Journey Through the Dark, and we're shortening it just to include the you know, Journey Through the Dark title. But the, the idea of moving through the dark, which this experience has been literally and figuratively, because obviously there have been many challenging events that took place uh, in the whole scenario of losing sight. I did not know I was really ill, 
and I had some symptoms and I had gone to doctors every month and I was being given different uh, antibiotics and prednisone uh, to you know, deal with sinus and ear infections and things like that. Nothing went away and I had testing for other things and nothing showed up. And I had no idea that I was really uh, ill, as ill as I was. And I was apparently at the point of uh, near death. The illness that they ultimately diagnosed was an autoimmune illness that had gone undetected. And uh, they were not able to diagnose it easily. And I was, uh, uh, had it not been caught in time, and I was this close, apparently. A friend heard the doctors say it's a good thing we ultimately found a diagnosis It took five weeks in and out of the hospital uh, and then another two weeks in between because I had a gap time, you know, between one visit and the other for different biopsies. But the, uh, my girlfriend overheard the doctor saying it's a good thing we were able to diagnose and begin treatment. She would have been dead in another few days. So it was that kind of a situation and many other things went on at the same time. Uh, literally the rug was pulled out from under me and I went through a divorce. Uh, I had stopped working for the governor of New Mexico. Uh, I was directing marketing for the cultural affairs program, loved my work, traveled all over the state, and really got to integrate well into New Mexico. I lived there for 10 years and worked for the governor for five and a half. And he was leaving office, so we all had to leave uh, with him and or jump ship and go over to another department. And I was gonna take a little gap and, you know, uh, and then slide back in and do something else in one of the other divisions and departments when I got sick. And uh, sight went in one eye, and then uh, three and a half weeks later, the sight went in the second eye. And what was so interesting about that experience was that that occurred over a three-day period. So at first, it was like looking through a mesh burqa. I don't know what that looks like, but we were talking a lot about it at that time, after 9-11. And I, it, it was like looking through a webbing of some kind, you know, some small grid. And then the next day, it went darker, and I'm observing all this with the observer journalist's eye, which of course I'm trained that way. And, and I, I, I saw this going on and then the third day, I'm blind and I can't see. And, and it, was, uh, uh, it was, everybody asked, they say, weren't you terrified? Weren't you frightened by all of this? And I guess I was so sick and I was so uh, just observing this process and kind of going through whatever shifts had to happen. I think that three-day event, it's kind of like the crucifixion to the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the three-day uh, to the resurrection, you know, from the tomb that we hear about in Christianity. It, it, I think they're all cycles. I think they're cycles of living, they're cycles of, of, of dying, they're cycles of being reborn. And so I think that three-day period gave me that bridge uh, to appreciate that I could still see, because with one eye I could see, but believe me, I'd be very happy to have one eye. I could see my son go to the Cristo Mountains. I could see the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the foliage out on the trees that were surrounding the, uh, the ranch land that I was living in on in northern New Mexico. And I could appreciate the beauty of my garden and I could, you know, see my children's faces and I could experience all this, you know, for the last time, uh, temporarily, I hoped. And it was an interesting transition. And the, uh, the, uh, the beauty of what has happened since then is I had a friend who had, and she became a friend, who was staying at the ranch and who became kind of my uh, aid, helper, uh, I call her my life coach because she encouraged me, she, she realized, you know, what I had done and I was very high powered and I'd done all these, you know, amazing things in my life. I've had a rather remarkable life. And she said to me, she says, you're going to be the same person that you were sighted. She said, you're not going to be a blind woman. You're going to be a woman who happened to have lost her sight. And I thought that was a very interesting, you know, approach. And I had a neighbor who would come over at every morning at 6.30 in the morning and we'd work out together, you know, we'd do our yoga stretching and, and our beach bodies and, you know, water, aer uh, not water, but, you know, standing aerobics and, and, and aerobics on the ground. And we would do that every morning for one hour. And then she'd go home and shower and go into the office in, in Santa Fe and I would shower and get dressed and be at my kitchen table, which is my command central where I would you know, make phone calls and do training because I was serving on the board of directors at that time of the um, 
La Plaza de Cultura y Arte Cultural Center in downtown Los Angeles. Gloria Molina was the chair of that board and the founding board member, and I was one of her five board members that helped create that new cultural center. So my commitment was to, you know, continue to work with that board and to continue to function as if I had an eight to five job, you know, that or more. And uh, so I would work at my command central and I'd be making phone calls, but how did I make the phone calls? You know, I couldn't see the dial and, you know, all these things. And so I got help with some of those things and I ultimately got a, an LG uh, talking phone, one of those little flip phones, and that helped me. That, that was recommended by the uh, Commission for the Blind in New Mexico. And they started sending people to the house to give me, you know, start tra retraining me on computer to learn audio software programs. And they gave me a reader to help me uh, begin writing this book. And so I was, I was gifted with a lot of support. And ultimately, they sent me to the Colorado Center for the Blind in Littleton, Colorado. And, and I, uh, I received independence training there. But I didn't realize it, but it was boot camp for the blind. And it was brutal, brutal. But the good news is I learned how to move and travel and you know, work with a cane and, and I regained my computer skills there and they have you do home economics. That wasn't hard for me because I cook and I still cook and I chop and I entertain and do all of that. But uh, uh, it was brutal and it was really geared to teens and 20s who were blind from birth and many of these students were just so gifted. They played the piano, they were actors, they did martial arts, they were swimming champions and competitors. Uh, they had so many wonderful skills. They were really a very talented bunch of people and they were there to you know, be uh, given responsibility and learn how to live independently away from their parents. So I'm a grown up with all my skills and my abilities and all of a sudden I'm being treated like I'm a you know, teenager and that wasn't fun, it really wasn't fun, and it was very hard uh, to, to go through all of that. And I had one teacher who was the mobility teacher who was like 27, and a, uh, she was like a little uh, drill sergeant, you know, you all expected her to click her heels, and, and she would always stand at the edge of the, of the there was a big island in the, in the uh, lounge of the, of the lobby of the uh, Littleton Center, and she'd kind of hang right at the corner where I had to make my turn to go either to the offices or go to the cafeteria or go to the restroom or wherever I had to go. And, and uh, she'd be right on this, hanging right on this corner. So I'd go up to her and I'd go, you know, I'd kind of, I'd touch her because I'm a feeler and I, I feel my way, I'd feel around a corner, you know, I notice that this, you know, curtain is right here. And so I'd touch her, she said, don't you go be touching on me. I said, sweetheart, you're not my type, you know. <laughs> we would have so much fun like that. And, and uh, uh, so I had to make light of it, and I had to, uh, we weren't supposed to ask for help, and we weren't supposed to take anybody's arm. You know, I've learned the lead and guard from the at Braille Institute in uh, Santa Barbara, where they're much more humane and less boot campish and much more, <laughs> uh, believe me. And, um, and so the, the uh, that boot camp approach, which might have been good for teenagers, you know, and, and 20 year olds who need to learn independence, uh, it might work for them, but I was an accomplished woman and I realized that for me, the growth was to be able to ask for help and to be able to receive it. And so that for me has been a big part of the growth and now I love it because I take somebody's arm and I always treat everybody as in a doctor's office, a stranger in the street who helps me, any gentleman or woman who comes up to, you know, offer me a hand. Uh, you don't want to be spinned around because that throws you off your center. You need to know where you are and keep your reference points. But I always teach them, you know, I hold your arm, you don't want to grab me by the hand or the wrist, you know, I want to take your arm and then put me behind you if I want to walk, be, you know, want me to walk behind so I don't wall, walk into a, a wall or a trip or something. And I say that way I'll be very obedient, you know, and so for me I joke about it that obedience has been one of the learning uh, curve, part of the learning curve in this experience. The other obedience is in this idea of journey through the dark. We're going through a very difficult, very painful process now in the growth of our country. And it is experiencing its own journey through the dark. Uh, there's a friend of mine in the audience, Grace, who I went to Brazil with, that's another story, but uh, 
when I, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're seeing the dark side of, you know, an individual. And she said, we're seeing the dark side of our nation, our personality as a nation, our individual, all of us. Uh, Hume talked about, uh, you know, the, the multiple, the sides of, of persona, anima, animus. And, and so we are, I think, as a country experiencing uh, this journey through our dark side. It's been around. Uh, we have a very painful and violent history in this country. We didn't learn about it in school, but we continue to learn more and more every year, every day, um, because you know different colonial powers came to this country and, and there were battles and people were killed. The original uh, inhabitants of this continent were uh, basically slaughtered. And, and that you know, has been a pattern throughout our history. So we have this darkness in the journey of our country. But the founding principles upon which we are based are very high-minded. Uh, they're, you know, talk about divine providence and the city on the hill and the idea of freedom, justice, and equality for all. These are beautiful principles. And these are very high-minded spiritual principles that, that we are to grow into and to continue to abide by and uphold. And we are going through this period, but it is also a period of awakening. And so when I thought this morning, I actually shifted everything in what I was going to say today, uh, based on just the shift I had in my own thinking this morning. And I, I thought, you know, my personal journey is not unlike perhaps what we're seeing in what, what's going on nationally uh, and now internationally um, uh, because of, of uh, different ways of thinking in this country and things that we thought we had given up, we fought a civil war, uh, things that we during different periods of time thought we had overcome and perhaps conquered and we haven't and there still is hatred and racism I just recently saw a video that I did for C-SPAN when I was a journalist and, and in 2000 when my book came out I was asked to moderate the C-SPAN panel on the border and I had three authors that were approaching border issues from three different perspectives and I was moderating and integrating a lot of you know my own thought and work with Freeholders uh, into that presentation and I urge you to look at it, it's on my website uh, it's called The Border, and it's a C-SPAN uh, show that I did, moderated. And the issues that I talked about then and that we all talked about as, as the members of that panel are exactly what we're dealing with today. And, and this is one of the reasons I, why I wrote the book then, that, that we have these uh, virtues that, were brought, that we bring into the country, this is also National Hispanic Heritage Month, that we bring into this country uh, with basically the shirt on the back, and, and people work up, you know, into wonderful positions, teachers, doctors, thinkers. We have a vice president, a presidential candidate, uh, Julian Castro, who is uh, running for president. Bill Richardson ran, uh, you know, when, when Obama and Hillary were running. He was the third candidate running at that time. And, and so everything that I talked about in 2000 still holds today in terms of the momentum and the positivism of this very vibrant, Latino, Hispanic, immigrant, uh, three, four, five, ten generations of people that have been here, uh, population. And so I would urge you to take a look at that, at that uh, uh, video clip. What I thought I would do is talk about how I have moved through the different stages of the blindness and how I have been able to uh, not only survive a near you know, fatal illness, and you know, get along with being blind, but to be able to thrive in this experience that I'm having. I live the life probably of three people. Uh, I travel, I traveled to Mexico City alone a year ago, May, and I stayed, by, nobody could go with me. None of my friends could go with me. I even offered to take my daughter with me. No, mom, I can't go, I don't want you spending your money. I, I just can't pick up and go like that. Well, why not, you know? I mean, good God, daughter, just, you know, I'm taking you to Mexico and you'll meet your family and it'll be a wonderful, you know, just a few days. I was gonna just take her for part of it. But the, uh, so I go alone. And I had a fabulous time and I saw my cousins in Mexico City and, and uh, they're the elderly cousins, my mother's first cousins, 91, 93, and 95, and just amazing 
people going strong and I have good genes and I'm very excited about that because that speaks well for longevity. But the, uh, so I traveled and then I went down to Oaxaca and met, uh, stayed with a new friend I met in 2014 when I was coordinating a Salt of the Earth a celebration of the making of that classic film which was uh, blacklisted and all the people involved in it, including Rosada Vueltas, the lead actress of the film, were blacklisted during the uh, McCarthy era. So these cycles just keep going around and around and around. But I think the transition points and the things that I have to had to deal with in my own personal journey through the dark are things that will apply to how we get through any kind of uh, traumatic, cataclysmic, life-changing event and certainly we're seeing this in our body politic uh, at the national level in the United States of America at this point in time. I think initially uh, the, the gift that I had going in was that three-day window, that Friday to Sunday kind of event, uh, that transition point that allowed me to see that something different was happening very slowly and then it, it was there. And I go, oh, I'm blind, you know. And I began to ask questions, well, what do I do with this? How do I do this? What am I being called? What is, you know, what am I being called to do? What is, what is mine to do now in this, uh, in this experience? And when I went into the hospital, I was blessed by having a really wonderful medical team. And I was totally open to whatever was going to happen in that experience. And I also drew upon my spiritual tools. I've always had a very deep and abiding faith in God. And I, uh, I have always acknowledged that. And very early on when I was doing uh, uh, growth development work, I, I did a, a program with, uh, called Intensive Journal Workshop with Ira Progoff, who was a student of Carl Jung, and uh, had that Jungian perspective of the underground, uh, the underground stream, which connects all of us. And life is really lived in this underground stream. It can be an overground stream, it's an all around us stream, really, but it's termed in, in Jungian thought as yes, the underground stream. And we draw from this, and we're all one, and we're all part of this stream of life. And what one person does to shed light on something opens it up for the whole universe. That's the belief in, in Jungian psychology as opposed to Freudian. And so that dialogue work really helped open me to the fact that my life was and is a spiritual journey. So I already was attuned to that. That was back in my 30s when I was doing those kind of studies. And I also was doing courses at the uh, Founders Church of Religious Science and I did the first and the second year course there with Bill Hornaday, who was a student of Ernest Holmes, who wrote the textbook Science of the Mind. And Bill Hornaday was a wonderful metaphysician. And just his tone of voice was healing. And my son, when he had a bicycle accident when he was nine years old, 10 years old, and uh, a fractured his skull, I called uh, Reverend Bill and I you know, told him that we had just found out that Joaquin had a a skull fracture and had to go through brain surgery, cranial surgery. And Reverend uh, Bill just said, now we know that Joaquin is just perfect and that God is, you know, God is at work in this situation. And there are no accidents. And I just heard those words and I was of course studying, taking classes with him at that time. It was very close to me because I was, Joaquin was a young boy and I'd been taking classes during that period of time when I took two years off with each child for my broadcast career and then went back into my broadcast career, but I wanted to be with my babies. My husband was a politician. We couldn't, you know, we had a very uh, chaotic uh, uh, political life, a lot of action. I, we were both away from the kids, you know, periods of time. And so I would drag my son everywhere I went for the first few years. And then when I had Danielle, I uh, would take her with me as much as I could, but she had an older brother and now we had childcare and, and the grandparents and so on and so forth. And so I could, you know, leave her with the grandparents and we could go off and do all of our politicking. But the beauty of that period of time when I took time off to do things on my terms, 
not just to work, not to turn, you know, turn the baby over to somebody at six weeks and, and give all that experience up of, of creating the foundation for my babies. I took classes and I did a lot of spiritual growth work during that period of time. So it was a fascinating period because I'm serving on boards of directors, I'm married to an elected official, I've got these babies, I'm nursing. Uh, I was on the California Highway Patrol Women Traffic Officer Project Advisory Committee to explore the feasibility of, of uh, employing women in the CHP and in law enforcement later in fire, you know, and, and all these other careers that were non-traditional for women. I was pregnant when I started that program. Then I'm nursing my son at the board table at the thing with these guys that said, over my dead body will women ever be in the CHP. And uh, we had, it was to Governor Brown's credit that, that uh, uh, he had a really diverse stakeholder group. We had men, no way in heck did they want anybody uh, to be on the CHP, any, the female. The commissioner said, over my dead body will anybody serve? And Governor Brown fired him and got somebody who was at least open to the feasibility of employing women. But we had women that didn't want women. And then there were those of us who were open to the feasibility of employing women in whatever careers women choose to serve, where they can pass the criteria to perform at a level that is uh, job related, not five foot six, 160 pounds, and a penis. I mean, that is not a job related criteria, is it? Really? <laughs> so the, the, uh, that was a really incredible experience, but I'm saying this because, you know, I was doing all of these diverse things, and yet I was doing this spiritual work and spiritual groundwork building upon, you know, what I had been raised uh, and had been taught in Sunday school and by my mother. And it's all in my book, it's all in the Freeholders. If you read chapter five, the faith chapter, it lays down uh, my, you know, my, my faith tradition, my sense of faith and the deep faith that exists within the uh, Hispanic and Latino culture. So the first thing that I experienced in going into the hospital uh, was this sense of spiritual tools that I had available to me. And these are available to all of us. We have tools for having a correct and right democracy, our Bill of Rights and our Constitution, our rule of law. These are our tools. And we need to work our tools to fulfill the dreams that were set forth by our founding fathers and mothers. And the same thing I had to do when I was in the hospital. And I was dealing with fear and with pain. And fear is one of the uh, factors uh, that we're dealing with very much in these times because it is so horrific all that is going on, it engenders fear. And when you have fear, you're immobilized. You cannot act. You're, you're frozen. Uh, people didn't vote in the last election. Uh, they will vote in this coming one because I think they're realizing that every single vote counts. And the, the uh, but I was feeling fear and pain. So again, my steps are a metaphor for what we're going through in our national uh, journey that we're experiencing right now. And so I knew I had to use my spiritual tools and somehow I was guided that when I had those lonely, fearful nights uh, in the hospital, you know, my family, my friends, the doctors, the nurses, everybody was coming and going all day long were gone. I'm in the dark, the room is in the dark, I feel the dark. And I was, you know, I had pain and I had fear some nights. And somehow I was guided to uh, recite declarations that I learned in Sunday school and from my mother. And I started reciting those to myself out loud. And I would, uh, I would, I would sing to myself a poem written by Mary Baker Eddy that was also a hymn that we sang in Sunday school and in church. And I used to play the organ in Sunday school until, you know, when I was in high school. And so I was very familiar with that song. And my mother would sing me that song when I wasn't feeling well as a child. And so there I am in this hospital bed and I'm singing these words. And um, the words are very beautiful. Oh, gentle presence, peace and joy and power. Oh, life divine that waits each, you know, whole, uh, special hour. And then it talks about, you know, 
guide my children, you know, on Upward Wing tonight. It's a protective uh, poem, a protective hymn for mother and for child. And the real words that, that really struck me at that time is, oh, make me glad for every scalding tear, for hope deferred, ingratitude disdain, to seek and love more for every hate and fear, no ill since God is good and loss is gain. I sang that to myself over and over and over again. And I never understood what the words of the declarations that I used to learn in Sunday school meant. I never really got that idea of, you know, uh, loss is gain. Who says loss is gain? But I understand it now in this transition of blindness. Because what, what was lost in one sense has been multiplied in the gifts of awareness and spiritual clarity and discernment that has been so much a part of this experience thanks to my upbringing, thanks to the learning and the, the study that I did in my 30s and beyond that where I've always been aware of being on this spiritual journey and how do I grow more, how do I, you know, how do I uh, arrive at that place of highest purpose and to be able to uh, declare that and act on it. And that has been a tremendous uh, part of this, this amazing process, this journey, which, yes, was scary, frightening, challenging. Uh, Colorado broke me wide open emotionally. I've never cried so much in my life. It was just traumatic and very difficult and uh, very lonely and isolating because I was the only grown-up in the program. And I had a bipolar 24-year-old uh, roommate on meds who hated her mother. So <laughs> it was like not a fun program. But I loved her and I tried to give her as much as I could because I'm naturally motherly. I used to counsel high school dropouts and so I'm trying to coach this woman and you know, get her through her ups and downs and encourage her to use her gifts and talents because she had a beautiful singing voice like an angel. And, uh, but it, it broke me open and maybe I wouldn't have broken open and, and gotten to the place where I, you know, uh, found myself, had I not been able to just emotionally crumble and then, you know, bring it back together again uh, through the spiritual principles that I've, you know, studied all my life. So the, the idea of using those spiritual tools of recognizing our inherent wholeness, you know, we are created uh, reverently and wondrously. And what would it be like if we recognized that in ourselves? I remember years ago I gave a talk at Glendale Community College. It was during Women's History Month, I believe. And I had run across a biblical passage, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I thought, well, that's a nice idea. But I don't believe we're made in fear. I don't believe we're supposed to fear God. We're supposed to revere God. And that means, and I, my hunch was, my gut feeling was, the word really in Aramaic was revere. We are reverently and wondrously made. How would we act if we really believed that? And we are. We are. And the, and the uh, you know, all these things that I learned, I started piecing them together. And virtues really was a part of that process too. And that was back in 2000 because the virtues are the building blocks of character. And if we exercise virtue, responsibility, respect, hard work, loyalty, and faith, you know, honesty, uh, fortitude, all the way to charity and, and uh, chastity, the, the, uh, it's an exercise in character building. And so those principles are very important to us. This idea of virtue, this idea of developing our qualities of spirit, the virtues, uh, these, these, these are all things and gifts that we have able to draw from and, and, and draw from and inculcate in ourselves. And so this, this experiment that I've had of moving through the blindness has been that. It's been relearning. It's been retraining. It's been learning how to cross a busy highway with an audio signal only how to walk down a meandering path by myself as an independence exercise, how to go over across the bridge and go over past the veterinarians, go across the driveway and get up onto the bond sidewalk and do my errands over there by myself. I get help, 
You know, if I get disoriented, I stand still for 30 seconds and somebody says, can I help you? And I go, yes, yes, help, help, please. Um, but it's, it's, and I've even called out and said, anybody here, you know, help, I don't know where I am. And immediately somebody sees me and uh, people, I guess, are watching, you know, out for me all the time. I have many, many angels. And so that's the other thing, that there are all these, uh, uh, there's a protective mantle that I carry with me and I don't have fear. I plunge out into the world without fear. And, and isn't that a gift? Because a lot of people want to live behind bars, you know, in their residences. And I do live in a gated neighborhood, but the, uh, I walk across the highway, go across a mile, half a mile away, all by myself. And I travel and I take buses and trains and people talk to me and help me. And, you know, I, I've got buddies at the, at the train stops, the red caps know me. In fact, one guy, uh, this morning I came in on the seven o'clock from uh, the desert uh, this morning, and one of the guys at Fullerton train station, John, is a new guy, I said, are you new? He says, no, I've been here for 20 years. I said, well, I've never had you help me before. He says, yeah, all the other guys go after you first. I never get a chance to help you. I've been hearing about you all these years, and I want to help you. Let me help you today. And so it was really sweet, because we had a wonderful conversation. And, and he had a beautiful, beautiful spirit. And I said, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from the United States. He says, but I, I grew up in, in, my dad was in the military, and I grew up in Spain and Germany and all these different countries. And I could tell, because he just had this largeness about him, this exposure to uh, multiple worlds and multiple cultures, which is what we have the opportunity to have in our country, which is so diverse, especially here in California and Los Angeles. And we need to learn from each other. We need to love each other and appreciate each other and draw from each other's uh, cultural beliefs and practices and foods and, you know, we all love the food, but what do they think? How do they live? How do they express joy? How do they express respect for their elders and, and all these under wonder, wonderful traditions and cultures that people across the globe have? And so this, this, this sense of raising ourselves up from the inside out has been a part of my process, a very conscious process of being more loving, being more compassionate, being more giving, uh, being, uh, being uh, more active of, of what is that it is that is mine to do. And I, when I was very early on, and I had just come back from the independence training program, I was staying with a girlfriend in, uh, in Santa Barbara, one of my college friends, and Sissy, and she had gone off one morning to uh, exercise class or something, I run, run an errand, I can't remember. But I was at home alone with my spiral notebook at her home. And I was writing longhand. I started writing this book longhand. And, and then I had a, a volunteer who read that back to me. She corrected my, you know, I said, change that, change that. She put it in red on the notebooks. And then she came back through and we read those 10 notebooks you know, word by word, and I typed in every word into the computer myself so I could make changes as I went, and then I organized the material into different chapters. So that was a, you know, a long process and a learning curve. But it was that taking the steps, breaking it all down, like the frijoles, you know, sorting and washing the beans, and taking such attention to the uh, smallest details of everyday life, and that was a lesson of the frijoles. When my mother said, you know, I asked her, what's made you so strong? And she said, beans, beans have made me strong. I didn't get it, I didn't understand it, until eight months later when I'm washing and sorting the beans, I go, that's it. That, that attention to detail, that sorting the good from the bad, uh, the real from the false, the truth from the lie, and that's life, that's what we have to do every day. And so that's what I seek to do every day. And, and what is really important today, and what is mine to do today. And at that visit with Sissy, I was writing in my journal that I learned during the intensive journal workshops back in my 30s. And it's a dialogue process of I and thou. And you, you, you have a dialogue with person, place, event, society, or body. And they're very revealing. You're really dialoguing with your higher self. And it's an I thou process. You can dialogue with persons living or dead. The dialogue with body is extraordinary. It is so funny, it's so painful, it's so real. If you pay attention to what your body's telling you, boy, does it give you a lot of information, but you know what we often don't pay attention? 
and I didn't in the early symptoms of the blindness. I was feeling off my personal mission. I was feeling spiritually disconnected because I wasn't doing anything about my spirituality at that time. I was just working for the governor and doing his work, not my own work, my spiritual work and my writing work. And so I wasn't paying attention to what my body dialogue told me, you know, the fall before I started getting sick. But this, uh, this sorting, this sorting that we have to do in everyday life. And there's something called divine discontent. And when we feel restless, and when we feel like uh, things are off and things aren't quite right, you know, what, what's going on? And we don't know, and some people go to drink or drugs or uh, sex or gambling or whatever it is, you know, uh, some kind of addiction. But the d divine discontent is really our higher self's way of saying, hey, you're off the mark. You know, it's not a sin, it's just being off the mark. It's an arrow archery uh, term. And it's, it's uh, what needs to be changed here. And out of that dialogue, I learned that my role and my purpose and my work to do was to write. You know, it is a gift I have. I've been a journalist most of my life. And in and the, and the image of my dialogue, I saw there was a path, and the path was straight ahead. And I wasn't to go to the left, I wasn't to go to the right, I was to go straight down this path, straight down this path, and, 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 and write, and do this book, and, and do that form of work, and creative work. Um, so I got that message very clearly, and I knew I had to write for my life. If I wanted to live, if I wanted to sustain in a healthy way, I had to be on purpose. And that was my purpose, was to get a book out that was going to help a lot of people. So, that part of the process, to discern, to use one's tools, our rule of law is a tool, our spiritual tools are tools, and we all have different practices that we can employ. The ancients and the moderns are now coming together in physics. Uh, Vedanta taught, uh, you know, the universal, universality of, of life, uh, of our oneness with Atman. Uh, call it God, call it Yahweh, call it Allah, call it Charlie, again, many words, but this idea of oneness and unity, uh, that we are each other, we breathe in each other's air as it goes around the globe, we are one, we are each other, and what harms one harms us, me, you. So all of these, these different forms of discernment have been very, uh, important shifts in this process. I write about the process. I write, you know, elaborately about many things. Uh, and, and knowing that my life has been a spiritual journey, and all of us are spiritual beings having a human experience. We're more than flesh, blood, and bones. Surely, most of us have come to some kind of awareness of that fact. And, and the, uh, all aspects of self have to be integrated, all aspects of self have to be uh, respected and given their due. One of the first things I learned, and I learned it the hard way, is I've learned most things the hard way. Um, the, uh, when I, I was first uh, blind, uh, the hardwood floors in the bedroom at the ranch were uh, wooden and they were slick. And I'm walking on stocking feet or I had booties or something on, and I slipped backwards and I hit my head conk hard on the mesquite headboard of the bed. And I go, ouch, I didn't need that. And I look up at this, towards the ceiling, what was that all about? And I got a very clear answer. I got these words that went flying through my head, blockhead, knucklehead, hardhead. I go, okay, what's the message here? <laughs> I asked, I spoke out loud, I said, okay, what's the message? And I got the very clear message. You need a daily spiritual practice. And so paying attention is important. We have many synchronous events. My hitting my head, and I've hit my head many times over the last 10 years, running into corners or walls or, you know, it's, 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 uh, and I always say, okay, now what, now what, now what? And uh, because, you know, it is a hard head. I have been a stubborn person. I have a strong will. And um, that has to be bent and shaped and honed and, and, and developed in, you know, new ways, especially now. But I got the message early on and I began to do a spiritual practice, a meditation practice, which I had done in graduate school. I did Transcendental Meditation with a Maharishi Mahishogi, nonetheless. 
And he's the one that they had the Harvard studies with that transcendental meditation was documented to uh, be a stress res uh, release, res you know, response. It lowered blood pressure. It had many positive biological effects on the body. And uh, Benson, Herbert Benson, who did those studies in, at Harvard, I spoke with him just last fall, and he said, yeah, we called it the, the, the relaxation response. He wasn't going to call it spirituality, because that's a little too woo or for cardiologists, but it was a new way of looking at the mind-body-spirit connection. And we discovered at that time, and I was consulting in Boston at that time and exposed to Benson there, uh, that uh, there is a mind-body-spirit connection. And what we think is what we get. And so that was another factor in, in the spiritual tool kit, was how am I thinking? Am I thinking loving thoughts? Am I thinking positive thoughts? Or am I, you know, being uh, annoyed or jealous or resistant or angry or, uh, you know, any other manner of negative thought? And thoughts are things. And we get what we pay attention to. All the training that I've had in, in spirituality and in different thought systems is that what we get what we pay attention to. So when we're being negative and hateful and we're, you know, railing at the television set, and there's a reason to rail, but, you know, that doesn't help anything. It doesn't help us and it doesn't help the situation. We have to reverse that and bring in that which we want, which is why I say my, you know, my affirmative prayer uh, for our country at this time is to bring in the rule of law, to know that our judicial systems are, are standing upright, that our court system is functioning, that our Bill of Rights is being honored, we're growing into our Bill of Rights, we're uh, growing into the fulfillment of our Constitution fully, that equality, liberty, and justice for all, all. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, this, this is key stuff. And so it transposes from the transition through a very traumatic, life-changing experience, which was a loss of sight, it transposes into how we have to operate and deal with our, our national picture as well. And so that's one of the reasons the book is not about blindness. Blindness was the vehicle for my learning to see in a new way. And one of the premises in the book is that when I was sighted, I was blind to many things. And in the blindness, I am more spiritually discerning and I see more clearly. It's an amazing statement to make, but it is true. And the ability to walk out of that hospital, I was wheelchaired out, you have to legally, and, and, but I walked out of that hospital alive and well. I was completely off of medication within 15 months. They started phasing me off after 12. And by 15 months off of it, I haven't a bit of disease in my body. I'm perfectly healthy. I'm strong. I'm thriving. I'm living the life of three people. And, and I'm productive and creative. It's very exciting to know that, that love opens up more creativity, uh, buoyancy, joy, peace, uh, reflection, meditation. All of these things that I've been doing over the years have just continued to buoy me and to, to uh, uh, allow me to have more creativity and a different kind of creativity. And so there have been many blessings in all of this. And the, one of them has been the blessing of courage. It takes courage to live. And my uh, rehabilitation coach, uh, counselor in New Mexico with the New Mexico Commission for the Blind, when I went through a divorce and I moved into town, I'm living by myself in a ro remote kind of you know, place. Beautiful place, but it was a little too remote, and I ended up moving because it was too remote. I didn't realize that I, need, I couldn't walk the streets in that neighborhood because there were too many ruts and stuff in Santa Fe. But the, she came to my house and she said, my God, you're brave. You know, I didn't understand it then, but a number of people have said that to me. And I go, well, I guess I am, but it takes courage to live. It takes courage to face up to... Uh, a life, catastrophic life change. And a lot of people uh, go under with it. Uh, they go into drugs or, you know, they become homeless, they live on the streets, you know, terrible things happen. Uh, they commit suicide, they get depressed. But uh, that hasn't been my path because I think the courage, which is a God-given gift, 
and it's drawn from the spiritual tools and from the meditation and from the practice, 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 uh, and resetting attention, paying attention and resetting intention, and to intend to be a certain way, uh, to live fully, to be creative, to be productive, to fulfill highest purpose, uh, to have the experiences that you know I want to have, uh, to experience unconditional love. All these things, these intentions, uh, are, are, are actively being fulfilled or have been fulfilled. And so I would say that you know, courage is something that we need also on the national level. And what do each of us, can, what can we look at in our own lives? What is our own kind of divine discontent that is driving us? I go, what, what do I have to do? What can I do? Oh, I'm, not, I'm powerless to do anything. No, no, you're not. None of us are powerless. One person, one vote, one act of kindness, one step in a direction of love and kindness and appreciation uh, works miracles. And the light that we shed in one place spreads out to many people and across the globe. For any of you who saw the film, uh, A Year of Living Dangerously, uh, it, was, uh, it took place during the Indonesian Revolution. And it was horrific, the poverty, the war, the violence, everything that was going on. And remember the, 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 the character actor, the photographer in the movie uh, uh, was uh, given an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. And it was, I, I'll never forget the words in the film, what can I do, what can I do? What can I do? What can we do? How do we, how do we help this horrific situation? Bloodshed everywhere. We can learn to love those who cross our path. That's a very powerful idea. And that's what we need today. We have to give love. We have to share love. We have to express love. We have to bring in love and know that uh, the powerful, positive, beautiful gifts uh, in ourselves gifts of spirit, of creativity, of intelligence, of wisdom, of joy, of peace, of serenity, of, of creativity, of everything, are things that we can draw upon and grow and develop little by little, every day, one step at a time. Krishnamurti talks about uh, three things. Is it possible? Is it not possible? Might it be possible? And if we can live in that place of possibility, and quantum physics is telling us there, because everything is possible. Everything is microscopic and tiny, and you can't feel it or touch it. And they say now even the observer shapes what we experience. And as a journalist, I knew that. If I went in rolling with a camera, and uh, you know, it changed the event. You know, now they stand up there with placards, they do everything, you know, rah, 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 cheer, cheer, you know, they, they know what to do in front of a camera. And so it becomes a different event uh, just because that camera eye, the observer's eye, the, the journalist's eye is there. But we each change our world environment by what we're seeing, what we're thinking, and what we're doing, how we're behaving, how we're responding. And so when we respond with that love and that peace and that serenity that's ours, we're going to change the world. Because one little ray of light expands, expands, expands. And, and that's why it's so important to be part of that life love, light, giving uh, experience. And so that's, that's been this process, that's been this journey. Uh, it's been a, an incredible time. And I think one other thought, apart from the ones I've mentioned, you know, the, the paying attention and, and intention and uh, setting, you know, opening possibilities and, and the, uh, is this idea that necessity creates capacity. When we're forced to do something, you know what? You either buckle down and fall down, or you buckle up and you do it. And I think each of us have that ability to do more than we're doing. We all tend to be lazy. I'm lazy. I mean, I, there are days I don't want to do anything. There are days when I'm not using myself fully. And I don't enjoy those days as much. I really like it when I'm on purpose and I've got to get something done and I'm charging forward and I'm doing something. But there are also times when you have to, you know, okay, what? that's a chill day today. Let's look at things differently. But this idea that necessity creates capacity has been so real for me because the, uh, 
being forced to look within, to be, uh, say, how am I going to do this? Why the blindness? To what am I blind? I asked that when I was up at Sissy's house way, way back when. And she started to cry. And she says, you're asking, you know, to what am I blind? You don't feel pity for yourself? No, I don't. You know, what, why is this experience coming to me? What am I to gain from it? What am I to give back from it? What am I to learn from it? What am I to share from it? I mean, I've always done that in my life. And, and she started crying. Uh, because there's not been a day of pity party. I learned not to do that from my self-mastery teacher when I was also in my 30s. I took a course on self-mastery. But the, the, uh, we have to live with what we got. We have to live in the now, in the present, today. It may be our only day. We may not be here tomorrow. Every day is a gift. The sun also rises, yes, and we look forward to that. But, you know, things change. I never expected to wake up blind one morning. But it has been, because I've asked those questions, what am I to do with this? What is mine to do? What is my highest purpose? How do I continue to live into that? And that's a question that all of us can ask ourselves, because at no time, like now, do we each need to ramp up our ante and to really draw from our best and highest selves to make sure uh, things shift and change and that our rule of law, our constitution, our bill of rights, the principles that guide this country are upheld and lived into fully so that uh, we have these, these uh, uh, a totally different world. And we're looking now at a global picture. You know, we have to look at climate change. We have to look at peace on earth. We have to look at all of these different things. And each of us has a role in all of this some way or other. Let's think on all the blessings that we have each day and be grateful for everything. The grateful air conditioning we have in here. You know, we're not sweltering. You know, we're, we're, we're sheltered and we're, uh, we're, you know, we're living, you know, fully to our capacities. Because it is a gift. I was very close this close to not being here. Life is a gift and it is a blessing to be alive. And it is a blessing to be here with you this evening and I thank you for being here and for allowing, allowing me to share my, my story with you.